Um, so welcome everyone to the signatures workshop. Um, unless the schedule has changed, I have like a hundred minutes. So what I what I've done is I've prepared a series of slides, um, which are which go through like the basic mathematics of snore signatures, of multi signatures, of adaptive signatures, and so forth to try to give. A, a background for some of these ideas that a lot of people have been talking about over the last couple of days. Um, with the goal of trying to, to give specific reasons for some of the difficulties, some of the difficulties that we have trying to, oh, I see how this works, um, trying to actually implement this and trying to define a sensible API and trying to define a secure API for doing these sorts of things. Because what we found, um, what I found, what I'm sure Connor found when he was implementing his ECDSA scriptless scripts, is that there's a whole bunch of extra stuff that needs to be verified when you're doing a multi-party, multi-stage protocol. And this is kind of implicit if you're reading it from like a, a published mathematical paper or something. You have a, a series of variables, so you assign them and then they stay assigned. Well, how do they stay assigned between, um, between steps in your protocol? If you've got some hardware wallet connected over USB and it's being unplugged, and maybe there are multiple things happening in parallel, and so on uh, and so forth. Um, so, if anyone has any any questions or wants to redirect me or thinks I'm going too slow or, or too fast, uh, you're, you're welcome to jump in. Um, it's kind of hard to be interactive with such a crap uh, a cramped room, but uh, but if you guys are comfortable with it, I encourage you to jump in. Um, so then, I guess I'm just going to get started. So these slides, these slides are, are basically all algebra. I've got like 26 slides of algebra for you. Uh, I'll try to, to gently explain this, and I'll try to make it understandable and intuitive. Um, and then when I get through the slides, then I'll switch gears maybe to talking about the actual API that I have in my kind of straw man test implementation of some of this stuff and some of the challenges around that. Although I'm not certain how I'll do that with a with a non-network laptop, but that's fine. That's that's a problem for the future. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens in an hour. So um, let me start with like the, the mathematical basics here. So in math, there's something called a group. A group is a set that has some sort of addition operation. Um, in elliptic curve cryptography, we have such a thing. We have a group of curve points. So all of our objects that we care about are points on a curve. This has kind of a geometric, intuitive meaning that, uh, that you might be familiar with. But we also have this addition operation, which is not something obvious. It's not like you're just adding the coordinates uh, in any particular coordinate scheme. Uh, there's actually some series of um, polynomial equations that you need to evaluate on the individual coordinates of two points, and then you get a third point out. None of that is important. All that matters is that somehow you can add things. The addition operation is, is something weird that does not behave quite like anything else, but it is compatible with itself, and it gives rise to this group structure. And as soon as you have, as soon as you have a group structure, you can think about taking some specific element, um, this element G, say, and adding it to itself. You'll get another element, adding it to itself, and so on. And you'll get a whole collection of elements, uh, all of which are multiples of G in some sense. And here the word multiple means that I've added G to itself a bunch of times. So there's a, a bit of a subtlety here in that when I talk about N times G, here N is a number, is an integer, G is a group element, um, and this multiplication is, is secretly code for, for doing this group operation a bunch of times. Okay, and if you have such a group, um, that's right, if I take only the multiples of G, that itself is actually a group, and we call that a cyclic group. And in cryptography, that's all we ever care about are cyclic groups. In elliptic curve cryptography, that's all we ever care about are cyclic groups, um, which have a whole bunch of nice properties that will let me talk kind of very sloppily about them and let me just add things together and, and not worry about the ordering and, and not worry about a whole bunch of, of thorny issues that appear with general groups. So, um, as I said, we can multiply um, group elements by integers, like so. Um, if we have some standard element, g here, we call that a generator, because every other element is a multiple of it, and that's, that's what generator means. We have this map from the integers to, to the group. And all we do is we take the generator, we add it to itself that many times. 
Um, this number here, x, is typically very large, something like 2 to the 256. That's something like 85 digits. Um, we can actually do this very efficiently. We don't actually have to do g plus g plus g plus b, you know, 2 to the 256 times. Um, there are much, much more efficient things to do. In particular, what we could do is actually just multiply g. We could figure out 2g, which is g plus g, 4g, which is 2g plus 2g, and just keep doubling that way until we have 256 um, multiple to g, that are all power of the 2 times g. And then we just take the bits of x. As a 256-bit number, that means that it is a sum of at most 256 bits. Um, and then because of this nice group property, we have this distributed law here. It means for every one bit in x, I can just add a corresponding multiple to g, and I wind up with at most 256 actual group operations that I need to do. That's one way to do it. Um, it's not a very good way to do it um, for, for crypto reasons. Um, in particular, um, anybody who's monitoring me doing that computation can time me and figure out how many additions I did. And since it's one addition for every one bit in x, that will tell them how many one bits are in this, uh, this number x. And if x is a secret key, I don't want to reveal anything at all about it. And so if, if I've written kind of naive code that uh, anybody with a stopwatch can infer the number of one bits in my secret key, that is actually enough information for them after observing you know, um, a couple hundred signatures for them to, to do something called a lattice-based attack um, and extract my secret key. Okay, so, so in real life, we, we can't just uh, do what I said, but my point is that there are very efficient ways to do this map. There are not efficient ways to do the reverse map. So here I just turned x into bits, did a bunch of additions. If I have a point, I know this point, um, I know that if this point is in my group, then by definition it's x times g, or some value of x. If I'm trying to find that value x, that's very hard. There is no efficient, uh, efficient meaning sub-exponential algorithm that will work on a classical computer that can do this reverse mapping for elliptic curve. Uh, for, for elliptic curve groups that don't fall into one of like 13 classes of weak curves. Um, and because this map is easy to do, very hard to reverse, we can use it as a basis of cryptography. Or these two facts. Hard to do, easy to do, hard to reverse, and we have this homomorphic property. We get all this sort of algebraic structure that's preserved, and we'll see, we'll see what I mean by that in a sec. So from now on, we're going to think of all of our numbers as secret keys, all of our uh, curve points as public keys. And, uh, and we'll sort of understand that there's this mapping between secret keys and public keys. That's, uh, that's hard to reverse. And I'll be, uh, be pretty consistent about using lowercase letters for numbers, uppercase numbers for points. Yep? Uh, do you know how far we are in uh, quantum computers? <laughs> <laughs> there will not be any quantum computers in time to threaten my career. Uh, <laughs> have very good reasons to believe that. Um, so, uh, just as an aside, I, I considered uh, in the first iteration of this workshop to actually do everything in Sage. So Sage is a computer algebra system. Um, it's, it's open source, it's, it's sort of Python with a whole ton of extra extensions added on that let it call into these underlying um, number theory libraries. Um, so you can actually define the, uh, an elliptic curve this way, and this is actually the elliptic curve sec b two fifty six k one, which is what Bitcoin uses, which is what Ethereum uses, and a bunch of other stuff. So you can see, I take this finite field. That means all the integers modulo some large prime. This this two to the two fifty six thing is a large prime. I define an elliptic curve. This is shorthand for the equation y squared equals x cubed plus seven. This is in, in, in safe math. And then I define this this value g, and this mysterious number here. Uh, comes from the, the sec G standards group. And so what I can do is I can create a, uh, a secret key here. I've just taken n here, this one integers mod the Q uh, group order. I have n dot random element, and now I have a secret key. There you can see what it looks like. That's a 256 bit number written in hex. And then I can cast that to an integer, multiply by G, as I said, and that means add G to itself over many times. Get the XY coordinates and print this out, and here's what a curve point looks like. So, um, so I just have this slide to try to give an intuition for, for what these things look like when you try to write them down. Um, you can see that despite the uh, kind of mathematical elegance and, and how clean all these equations look, in real life, when you're actually doing cryptography, you have stuff like this. And you can imagine 
um, if I give you a curve point like this and say, hey, from this, try to find the secret key, you can see that that's uh, not immediately obvious how to do it. In fact, in fact it's very hard. Yes? Uh, you pointed out that the G is from the library. Is it possible to pick a G that is uh, uh, very easy to reverse? Ah, no, uh, that's a good question. So. Um, there are actually two pieces to that question. One, one question is, is it possible for this G, uh, this G parameter, you see it's got some long random number, could that be backdoored in some way, right? Like, could it, um, could it somehow weaken the security of a crypto system that used it if this random number had turned out to be bad news, right? And the answer is no, actually. Um, no matter what I choose for G, um, there is a, a simple algebraic transformation from this G to any G you might imagine. Meaning that if it's possible to break uh, any of these signature schemes for some maliciously chosen G, there's a simple transformation from that attack onto this G, and then you can break the real scheme. And so the contrapositive of that is that because you can't break this, you cannot break it for any malicious G. Then the second question, which is, well, you know, that, that, that's all nice and good, but was this maliciously chosen? And the answer is no, because this number, as large as it is, is actually not 256 bits. So here this lift x function means I'm defining a curve point by specifying its x coordinate. All these numbers are 256 bit numbers. So you can see this is a 256 bit number. This thing is actually only a 163 bit number, um, which uh, very few numbers between 0 and 256 are so small. This is clearly a very specially chosen number. It appears to be a hash of some sort. Um, but the fact that it's so small um, means that there isn't really any room for it to have come from some specific malicious source. And also, uh, this specific number appears in many other elliptic curves, um, like unrelated elliptic curves defined by sec -G. Now, being said that, if anyone knows the origin of this, I'd be very curious to know. Yeah, um, I haven't found it either. There yeah. was a big uh, uh, a few years ago. Somebody tried to find out, but like, right, yeah, so it's a great Mac quote, contacted SecG, um, and the people there said that they think the person responsible for this con con uh, constant has since died, and he did not write down where it came from. So it's a very mysterious number, but it is not like some random number that could have been ground out. It was, it was a very constrained number. Uh, is there any particular reason to prefer one generator point over another? No, just whatever. Um, Whatever is easy, basically. Um, so you can see, actually, I took this magic number and I multiplied it by two, g negative two. The reason for that, I think, is that when you multiply by two, you get a curve point that has that doesn't have such a small small value. But multiplying by two is not enough to give you the freedom to to do bad things, but uh, it is enough to maybe make your algorithms work more consistently. Amongst. But I mean, there's no no real reason to choose anything in particular here. Uh, oh, you. But you could theoretically choose a malicious EC parameter that somehow makes it easier to... Uh... So the, the parameters that you can choose maliciously are these two here. Yeah. So you can choose the, the curve um, order, and you can choose the, um, the specific equation that's used for the curve. Um, and in order, the only known ways to choose these maliciously are to choose an elliptic curve that has a number of specific mathematical properties that were shown to result in insecure curves uh, throughout the 90s and early 2000s. So in the past uh, almost 20 years, there actually have been no new classes of weak curves found. Um, so as long as you avoid these specific classes of weak curves, you're good. And then all the rest of this parameter choosing is, is doing stuff for efficiency reasons, basically. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the the question was, um, what uh, I mean, what what could be chosen maliciously here, and and the answer is, is these two things. The generator actually does not really give you any freedom for for malicious. Um, so why is that number being used then? Uh, because it is in a standards document that is many years old. <laughs> no. uh, sorry. The, the question was was why why are we using these magic numbers? Um, and the answer is, I mean, Satoshi chose it from a small list of standard curves. Um, and this one actually happened to have some nice efficiency properties that I think he lucked out on getting. I was actually referring to the x coordinate. Like, like, what if oh. you just chose three? Oh, if I chose like three? Yeah, yeah uh, I, I can choose whatever x coordinate I want, and all of this stuff will work. But the signatures I produce will not be verifiable 
by somebody using the standard generator. So everybody has to agree. Oh, okay. Yeah, so everybody has to agree on all of these parameters okay. for, for signatures to be verifiable. Wait, was it Sirtecon that came out with those standards? Uh, no, it was SEPG. Is Sirtecon part of SEPG? I, I, yeah, I don't know the members of SEPG specifically, but it's a standard body. It's not NIST. Um, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quick question. If you pick zero, will it still be safe? Ah, that's a cool question. If you pick zero for the X coordinate, um, you will actually get a point that is not on the curve, it turns out. There is no, so the curve equation is Y squared equals X cubed plus seven. If you plug in zero to that, you get y squared equals seven. Turns out seven is not a square root, in, uh, or seven has no square root in uh, in uh, this this field. So, uh, but but if it happened to be on the curve, it would work. Yeah, there would be no security issue there. Okay, follow up. Is one okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I believe, not two. I believe, I believe the four is the smallest one that works. Um, but this is this is not too hard to check. Actually. But, I won't, I won't do that. <laughs> but seriously, you, you run this command, you stick zero in there, and it will you throw an exception. So you stick one, it'll throw an exception. You just do that, and I think four, four is the first one that works. Um, but in, um, in general, 50% of all possible values are going to work. The, the, what, what makes it work or not is whether or not this, the, the number that you get is a square root, and half of the, half of the possible numbers are square roots. Or have, have square roots, sorry. That's just, just because every... Whenever you square something, there's one other number that squares to the same thing. So you have a two to one mapping, so necessarily the reverse mapping only has half of, of available values. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, I, I really like talking about this because it's got a bunch of mysterious constants, um, but ultimately they're, they're very old mysterious constants that don't have any room for funny business. Um, yeah, and there's not, not too much to say. Um, but definitely, if you want to play with any of this stuff, you can definitely like download Sage, um, or you go to like sagemath.org. I think there's online workbooks you can use. Just copy and paste these these four lines from somewhere, um, and then uh, and then you can generate keys. You can generate signatures. You can verify signatures. All this good stuff. Both one and two works. Both both one and two. Yes. Uh, At least it did an error and say it was not on the. On did zero error? Yes. All right. Carl says that one works. I'm, I'm not gonna. Well, <laughs> nerd slaves. No point with x coordinate. Okay, one works. One and two work. All right, moving on. <laughs> yeah. What's the order of the group? Oh, the order of the group. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, so this here is the order of the field. This giant uh, mysterious number that is almost two to the two fifty six, but not quite. Um, the order of the field, or sorry, the order of the group here is another 256-bit number. Um, it is about um, 2 to the 127 smaller. Um, so it is missing about 1, 2 to the 127 uh, of the possible 256-bit values. Um, it does not have a nice compact representation like this. So here, like, the, um, the field order was chosen specifically to have be mostly 1 bits. So we took 2 to the 56 and, and subtracted as few bits as we could. The, uh, the curve order just kind of comes out. And it will always be plus or minus um, the square root of this from this. That's a, that's a theorem called Hassel's theorem. Uh, and that's prime. Yes, and it's prime. Oh, to, yeah, to be clear, the order of this, this curve is prime, um, which, is, which is very nice. It means that any points on our curve are also in our group, because prime order groups have no non-trivial subgroups. Uh, but we don't need to know that for anything that I'm going to talk about. Okay. All right, so let me, let me talk about one cool thing you can do with curve points before I even start to talk about signatures. Um, let me get a clock in front of me. I can do this for 80 minutes. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited. I haven't had a classroom in a long time. I dropped, I dropped out of school and they don't let me teach. Now I'm trying to drop out. Um, cool. So there is a um, there is a cool thing you can do with these elliptic curve points. Uh, a very general thing you can do. You can use them as commitments. The cryptographic commitment is something that, uh, for our purposes, is going to be hiding and blinding. Um, is something where you take some function, like say 
Let's just call it a hash function. Um, let's, let's call this h. I put something into h. What comes out of h is some random looking thing. Um, and that random looking thing cannot be predicted in advance uh, without just running the h function. Um, just given the output of h, given the hash, you can't learn anything about what went in other than by just like guessing values that you might think it might be and seeing if the output matches. And also, um, given, um, also it is very hard to find two things that hash to the same value. That's called collision resistance. Um, so the result is that if I'm thinking of some secret 256-bit number, say, I can encode that somehow, I can run it through a hash function, and, uh, and then I can publish this hash to you all. And this does not reveal anything to you about my number, but now I'm committed to the number. Because if I later do something uh, that I'm saying I'm doing with the number that I gave you and then reduce some interactive protocol or something, at the, and then at the end of the protocol I reveal the number I was thinking of, all of you guys can run that number through the hash function and check that it matches the hash. And because it's hard for me to find any two things that hash to the same thing, what I reveal to you must have been the one thing that hashed to it. Um, and conversely, because the output of the hash doesn't reveal anything about the input, none of you guys could figure out what I was thinking of before I actually revealed it. Um, so the, um, we have a few professional cryptographers in the room who maybe are cringing at this term cryptographic hash. There are actually specific properties that hash functions have, such as collision resistance and pre-image resistance and blah, blah, blah. Um, for our purposes, a hash function is a, a mathematically random function. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, how does this uh, commitment differ from a regular hash? Mm, okay, so Repeat it. The, the question is how does this commitment differ from a regular hash? So let me describe this commitment and then, then we'll talk. So here, h is going to be a regular hash for the for, in this slide. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this h um, hash function, which is perfectly capable of producing commitments, and I'm going to use it to transform an elliptic curve point into a commitment. Okay, I'm going to do it using this formula here. I think of a, a curve point. I hash um, the curve point alongside these double bars, mean concatenation. Um, I hash the curve point uh, alongside whatever I want to commit to. And then I multiply that by g and add, add it to my original point. And so I'll get a new point. So I've taken some point. This is just a pair of, of 256 bit numbers. I got a new point. And the new point is actually a commitment. And what's cool about this is that the way that I got the new point from the old one is that I just added some mysterious thing times g. Well, that means that um, my secret key, which is the thing that times g equal, equaled my uh, point, um, to get the new secret key corresponding to the new point, I just have to add that mysterious thing, not times g. That's all. You can sort of see if I multiply both sides by g here, I will get that. So, so it all works out. So I get a commitment, which is not only a commitment, but it is also a curve point for which I know the discrete logarithm for, and I can make signatures with it. I know the secret key. Um, I can do all sorts of cool stuff. So how this commitment differs from an ordinary hash function is that if I take an ordinary hash function and I hash something out, hash something up and give that out, the result is just going to be some random gibberish. It's going to be some random 256-bit number without any particular structure. And what I get out of this commitment scheme, out of this hash function, is actually an elliptic curve point that I'm able to produce signatures for. And what's cool is that I can produce signatures for this without ever revealing that it's even a commitment. So to demonstrate that I even did this commitment, I have to reveal my original point and what I committed to. But if I don't do that, this commitment point is going to look uniformly random to anybody looking at it. Um, just like the original point did, they can't even tell that there was a commitment. So this is really like a, a very um, surreptitious thing to do. But, um, but if you didn't add p prime, you could tell that it was. Ah, so if I didn't add p prime, um, uh, no, the the other. Okay, uh, the, the question is, what if what if I don't? What if I change this equation so it's not this equation? So if I don't add this p prime here, um, then the result. It's going to be on the curve at that point? Uh, yeah, it will be on the curve. The result will be a point that is just this hash times g. And this means that anybody who learns this hash, such as after I reveal a commitment, will then know the secret key to the resulting point. So the secret key to this is my original secret key, 
plus this thing, which will become public at our reveal commitment. So by adding this P prime, I ensure that the secret key remain, remains secret even after revealing the commitment. If I didn't hash this P prime, um, if I didn't hash P prime into here, the result actually would not be a commitment. It would turn out that I could choose some other C after the fact. I could change what I committed to and, and produce a fake proof. And so inserting P prime here undermines my ability to produce fake proofs. Okay, so we'll come back to this uh, in two contexts, but uh, uh, figured. Just one thing is that um, it's a traditional commitment has to be hiding even for low entropy messages. This one is not, right? Um, so this is hiding for low entropy messages. So if C is low entropy, say. So this has pretty much the same. If if H is a random oracle, then this is a random oracle. Sure. Right. You can try, right? Suppose C is one bit. Yeah. Then you can just try for both of those. Uh, so you actually cannot because you, you need to know P prime and P prime no, is P going. Prime is not public. P prime is not public. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so because to open this commitment to to prove that it was actually a commitment, you have to produce both P prime and C. If P prime becomes public, then somebody can, can probably guess C. Um, if, if it comes from a small space of possible things, they can guess it. Um, yeah. Uh, no, no, that's exactly the right way. So the, the question is, um, in Bitcoin, a uh, key pair, or X is your secret key, P is, is your public key. Here, what I'm saying here is that if you have a key pair like that, you've got this X prime, P prime. So this, this P prime could be corresponding to some Bitcoin address, and X prime is, is a secret key in your wallet. You could do this operation on it, and you would get a new pair that you could insert into your wallet. And now you can sign for both of them now. And they will both just work as, as key pairs, just ordinary key pairs. So in order to sign with P, you do not need to reveal P prime. You just produce a signature with this, um, with this secret key. When you sign with it, you don't reveal anything about it. In particular, you don't reveal that it was produced by this equation. Um, so you can just sign with it without revealing P prime or C. And, and no one will be any of the wiser. OK, so I'll, I'll come back to this a couple times, uh, but let's move on. Oh no, I'll come back to it immediately in the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, uh, the first first use of this uh, is, is exactly um, what, what you asked about. Um, suppose that we have a, this is actually a key pair on Bitcoin. Okay. Then what you can do is have a Bitcoin key pair, like a Bitcoin address, and the address is secretly some commitment to some extra data. And the way that you prove that that address is a commitment is by revealing the original P prime and your extra data. And this is a scheme that's called pay to contract. Um, and okay, I think the next slide calls this paid a contract, but it is paid a contract. Um, at the top, yeah, it's also in the title. And next slide, next slide says paid a contract. Um, so you have uh, an address that is a commitment. That's I think all that, that this says. Um, so this is called paid a contract. Um, it's been just sort of a, a folklore construction that's been around forever. Um, Timo Hanke um, and um, Gerhardt, whose who's, uh, first name is not coming to me, uh, uh, published a paper in 2012 that described the scheme. That scheme failed to include <coughs> the second P prime. It did not hash P prime, so it actually was not a uh, was not a commitment. Uh, but this one is. But so it was very we were very close to having it in 2012. And so actually we use this in the liquid sidechain, just to, uh, to to plug my own products for a second here, um, in order to move coins into the liquid sidechain. You create a new output on Liquid, and you do a pay to contract. You, you send coins on Bitcoin to an address controlled by the Liquid functionary set, but you do the pay to contract construction on their public keys, and the result is that you send coins into the sidechain, and that the, um, the output that you create on Bitcoin actually commits to an output on Liquid. And then you go to the Liquid sidechain and create a transaction, and you reveal P prime and, and C, um, and say, hey, I gave these coins to the functionary set. Uh, they committed, the coins that I gave commit to this particular output. Please give me the coins of this output. 
and the uh, consensus rules of the system know how to interpret that beta contract. They know how to interpret that commitment, and that ensures that the coins go to the right place on the side chain, given nothing but a spend on the Bitcoin chain. So that the, the two blockchains don't have to really communicate uh, with each other in any more intricate way than just inspecting the output. Um, but we could even use this construction on Bitcoin itself. So one, one of the words uh, that has been in the media a whole bunch uh, is tapered as this new like kind of novel thing. Um, it's kind of embarrassing that it took us this long to come up with tapered um, because it's really just this paid a contract idea that's been floating around forever. The idea behind tapered is what if we did a paid to contract of our Bitcoin scripts? So right now in Bitcoin, every output has a script that describes how you spend it. Usually that script is just like, I want a signature with a certain public key. And so you think of, of coins as having public keys. You can do more elaborate things, of course. You can do multi-signatures, you can do conditional things, you can do time locks, you can do whatever you, you might think of. Um, and right now, uh, the way that you do these scripts is by creating an output that is very identifiably a script-based output and publishing that to the blockchain. And the, uh, the script describes the spending policy of your coins. So if you have some coins that are controlled by like two of three of some set of parties, um, everyone can see that they're controlled by two or three parties, and so on. Um, but imagine instead that we committed to the script with, um, with this pay-to-contract construction. And imagine further that our original public key had a secret key that is jointly held by these, these three parties, or maybe two or three parties, or whatever. Um, and I'll explain in, in the next few slides how you might do that. The result would be an output which to any onlook, onlooker just looks like a single public key. And it can be spent like a single public key. And if all of the participants in this contract, this contract that might say, oh, two or three people need to spend, or maybe after a certain amount of time, somebody else spends, or maybe you need a hash lock or, or whatever. If all of those parties agree to just spend the coins and don't need the blockchain to validate that the specific conditions were met because somebody was, was not being cooperative, then they just jointly produce a signature and spend the coins and they never need to reveal what their script was, or even that there was a script. And so what this means is that in conjunction with script with scripts, which I will, I will get to, um, that you can have outputs that have pretty much arbitrary spending policies on them that just look like single public key outputs. And this is what Taproot is. Um, it lets you uh, take basically every application of Bitcoin script that's in use in the wild right now and make them all look identical to ordinary single user wallet spends. Um, and the application, is that P prime or P? Video P? Uh, I guess that should be P prime, let's okay. see. Um, yep. Thanks. Um, yeah, so to be consistent with the previous slide, there should be a prime there. Yeah, so P, P itself is, is public, that's part of the output. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about signatures. Okay. So, um, if you remember from TLO, if you remember from my first slide, we have this mapping from secret keys to public keys that has all these nice algebraic properties. We're going to exploit these to reduce digital signatures. And so the way we're going to do that, we're going to assume we have a key pair, X and P. Um, so I'm going to be consistent about using X for, for secret keys and P for public keys. I'm also going to be consistent about using K for secret nonces and R for public nonces. So when you're producing a signature, um, and the two signature schemes I'm going to talk about are BCDSA, which is used in Bitcoin and, uh, and Ethereum, and, uh, and also Schnorr, which hopefully will be used in Bitcoin uh, in, within our lifetimes. And <laughs> the way that they both work is that uh, as a first step, you, you take some message M that you want to sign, it's probably some Bitcoin transaction, um, you generate this, this nonce, okay? And it's basically, the nonce is actually a key pair. I'm, I'm calling it an ephemeral key pair here. It's just a, a unique, uniformly random thing. Um, and earlier, when I said that it was dangerous to reveal the number of one bits in your secret key, I asked you it was slightly lying. In real life, your nonce changes for every single signature, so if you reveal the number of one bits in your nonce, that's how you leak your secret key. Because the nonce changes every time. So if you if you're, have any bias there, if you're leaking any information um, in every signature, it will be new information because it's a new nonce you're leaking about every time. Um, so this really has to be uniformly random, even if your public key is not. But your public key should be too. Is that a PlayStation? 
Yeah, okay, so yeah, so the PlayStation 3, um, you can now uh, load Yellow Dog Linux or, or whatever. You know, I haven't looked at this in 12 years, so maybe people don't use Yellow Dog anymore. Um, right, the, the way that the PlayStation 3 was eventually uh, cracked is that Sony released two PlayStation updates in a row that um, did much worse than revealing the number of one bits in the nonce. They actually used the same nonce in two consecutive signatures. And uh, for those of you who remember linear algebra, um, you can see we have here, I think it was an ECDSA signature, we have this linear equation, I should have highlighted here, but K and X are secret, secret data, um, and everything else is public. I have an equation and two unknowns. Can't solve that. What Sony did by using the same secret key and the same secret nonce and two signatures is provided two equations and two unknowns. And you can uniquely solve that very efficiently. Um, and somebody did, uh, and they learned Sony's secret nonce that they like to use, and also Sony's secret key. Uh, and then, then they were there, then able to sign their own PlayStation updates, which, uh, which fixed all of the Sony. So, so yeah, don't, don't reuse nonces. Don't, don't bias your nonces at all, but certainly definitely don't reuse them. Uh, then you can just, people can extract keys. Oh, that, that is a good question. Um, so, to generate a nonce, it should be uniformly random. So there are two things that you can do. One is you um, obtain some source of randomness, like dev random or something like that, and you run it through a hash function to, to widen out any bias that, that might be there. It's as long as you have uh, sufficient entropy that what you put into that hash function can't be guessed, then you're okay. Um, the smarter way to do it, as long as you are producing your own signatures, if you take your secret key and your message to be signed, and you hash those together. And so way back when I introduced our hash function h here, I said that it was a, a uniformly random function. Um, if, if we believe that that could be true, and, and we do Bitcoin depend on this in a lot of ways, then the result will be a uniformly random number. It's unbiased, we can use it as a nonce. But what's cool about it is that if you ever try to say, sign the same message twice, you will get the same nonce each time, and you will produce exactly the same signature. So it becomes impossible to reuse a nonce. Because as soon as you change the message you're signing, you also change the nonce. And if you don't change the message, of course, you're just doing the same signature. That's not revealing anything at all. Um, yeah, so, so generally, the way that you do it for a single signature is that you hash up your secret key in your message. But as we will see, even though that solves a lot of logistical problems about sourcing randomness on every single signature, it causes problems down the road as multi-signatures. Okay, so you choose your nonce, um, and then you compute a challenge. Um, so I'll talk about in Schnorr. In Schnorr, you hash up your public key. Um, this is actually not quite Schnorr. Schnorr did not hash his public key, which uh, just made his scheme less composable. Uh, you hash your public key, your, your public nonce, and your message. You get this challenge E. In ECDSA, you do this weird thing where you sort of split your challenge in two parts. You hash the message by itself, and then you like hash your public nonce by taking the x coordinate of it as a curve point and interpreting that as a number, um, which is just so, I mean, you can't really reason about that operation, but in practice, it turns out that it's basically secure. And then you do, you do this, uh, this equation here. And you can see I've, I've written these equations in this way, so it looks like ECDSA and Schnorr are very similar. I've just rotated a couple variables, although I'll note in, in practice, your signature here is going to be S and R. If you're computing a, a S such that this is true, you can see I actually have to divide both sides by K. So when you're computing an ECDSA signature, you, um, you need to do uh, an inversion. So it looks like a much grosser equation, but really it's just this. It's just a schnorr with a bunch of variables rotated. a signature. Um, it's actually it's algebraically very simple. And the security of your signature ultimately comes down to um, your signature is one equation and two unknowns, and you can't solve for that. Um, provided that all of your values, all your secret values are uniformly random, because otherwise you cannot 
fit them into some sort of lattice and exploit that bias by doing some sort of transformation that amplifies the bias. But ultimately, one equation, two unknowns, you can't see any of the secret data. Okay, um, so before I explain how to verify this, which is, is very simple, um, or a very simple transformation of, of how to sign, let me come back to, uh, to this pay to contract point commitment thing for the last time, I think, um, and just quickly talk about something called sign to contract. Sign to contract is where you take the nonce R, which remember I said it is basically just another key pair, um, and you stick a commitment in there. And the cool property of, of doing that um, is that you can commit to something in an ordinary signature that you can then publish to Bitcoin or something, and you can fit a commitment uh, onto the Bitcoin blockchain while taking zero additional space. Um, and this is something that I have, I have a pull request against open timestamps to support doing this so that you can timestamp data by just uh, you know, hiding it inside of a signature in, uh, in an ordinary blockchain transaction that was going to be published anyway. Um, so I lied, we will actually come back to it again when we talk about multi-signatures, but, uh, but let me come back to signatures for a second. So, verification. So here is the same equation that I just showed you a couple slides ago, um, ECDSA and Schnorr. To verify this, you can see that if I give you values S and R that supposedly satisfy this, you can't actually verify it. Because if you guys don't know X, you don't know K, um, how can you verify this equation? Uh, how can you verify that it was computed correctly? Well, the answer is that we can multiply every term by G, and these are equivalent, whether or not G is there. Um, but after multiplying by G, I get a mathematically equivalent statement, which now only involves public data. So here I replace all the KGs as Rs, and all of the XGs as P. Because remember, that, that's how our curve points, uh, that's how our key pairs are defined. And now you can see that to verify an ECDSA signature, if you do this, to verify a Schnorr signature, you compute that, and you can see now that this involved only public data. The, the key P, of course, is part of, uh, part of uh, it's just a public key um, that is on the blockchain. Everyone, everyone knows which public keys you use, and then S and R are actually the part, <laughs> parts of the signature, and E is a hash of, of some stuff. Okay, so there's a cool property of this. So I've, uh, I've carried over the uh, um, Schnorr verification equation and the ECDSA verification equation here. So something that, uh, kind of a buzzword that we throw around a lot is that Schnorr signatures are, are linear. Um, and this is why it's easier to do scriptless scripts uh, with Schnorr signatures. But let me explain what, uh, what is meant when people say that. Um, the property they're referring to is that with Schnorr signatures, this equation is actually very, very nice. Um, given two signatures um, on, let's say two signatures on, on the same message. For, for now, for on the same message hash, which actually is, is uh, going, so this is a multi-signature. There's two parties, P1 and P2, both want to sign the same message. What they can do is they can add their nonces together, and then they can hash the resulting public key and, and nonce and message and whatever. They get some challenge E, and then each one of them just produces their own Schnorr signature, S1 and S2. And you can add S1 and S2. You can add R1 and R2 to get like an, a new SR, which is a signature with public key P1 and P2, P1 plus P2, which is sort of jointly controlled by both parties. And the reason you can do this is that these two equations are both linear equations. I can add both sides. Um, this plus this must be equal to that plus that. Um, and the difficulty in doing this with ECDSA is that now you can see that I've got S1 and R1 multiplied together in my verification equation. Now if I add these, I get S1, R1, plus S2, R2, and there's no way to pull those apart um, and describe them purely in terms of, of one party signature and in terms of the other party signature, which means that unlike in Schnorr, where each person can basically do their own signature, which we know doesn't leak any information because we know the signature that's secure, um, and with, with a CCDSA, you can't do that. There's no nice way to isolate um, stuff involving the first party secret data and stuff involving the second party secret data. So you need to do like this multi-party computation thing. And that's where the Pellier encryption comes in. That's where all the complicated stuff that Connor was talking about yesterday comes from. Okay. Um, as an aside, you can also use this to do like batch verification and, and some other tricks that I don't, I don't have time to, to go into. But this linearity is kind of the cool property and it's going to be the basis for pretty much everything. 
Okay, so multi-signatures, as I said, um, you can you can exploit this linearity property to do multi-signatures. You have a whole bunch of parties, you can add up all the public keys, you can add up, um, if they want to produce a signature with a, a public key that is the sum of these signatures, then they all produce this uh, nonce, they add up their nonces, they get some challenge E, um, and then they each produce their own signature, and we get the signature here, and you can see that SG equals R plus EP, that's their Schnorr signature verification equation, and all of, all of these sigmas and, and sums and stuff are just exactly what I had on the, on the last slide, except we can see that it works for any number of parties, not just, uh, not just two, but there's kind of a, a logical sleight of hand here, right? It's clear that if these n participants all follow this protocol, and, and do their own signature component here, that the result will be a signature that is valid. It's not clear that given a signature to satisfy this equation, that actually all n parties needed to, to participate. Even if the key is known to be the sum of these public keys. Okay, like I'm kind of combining a bunch of public keys into one signature, claiming that it's a multi-signature, and saying, oh yeah, the presence of this multi-signature means everyone had to, had to participate. Not true. Okay, so. Oh, the, the question is why is P in this hash? Yeah. So in, in traditional Schnorr signatures, P is not in this hash. Um, the reason that P is in the hash for all of these equations is that it transforms the Schnorr signature from a, a strong signature which is a specific uh, thing in cryptography, it means that no one can produce a forgery, to a proof of, a, a zero knowledge proof of knowledge of a secret key, which is another thing in cryptography, which is actually a much stronger thing. Um, well, it's, it's different, it's not strictly stronger, but it's, it's much more useful. And the result is that when you're using Schnorr signatures in larger crypto systems, such as a multi-signature scheme, you can use this proof of knowledge property um, to, to prove security. And if you didn't have that, if you only have the strong signature property, that's actually insufficient to prove security of a lot of larger schemes that use Schnorr signatures in creative ways. So for multi-signatures or for ring signatures or something like that, if we didn't have this commitment, then, uh, then those larger crypto systems would be broken. Okay, so it's sort of not so important for signatures, it is important for things that are based off of signatures. But, so this is not uh, resistant if I craft my public key in a smart way that it's actually uh, it will subtract the other keys. That's yep, that's absolutely. So the, the question is uh, this slide. Um, but oh, is there something else? So uh, what cryptographers usually do is not add them, we just list them in a hash. Right, you can do that, absolutely. So if you list all of the individual public keys like this, um, and you you need to do a so couple more things. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, it will be a longer signature, it will still actually not be secure. There are some additional things you need to do. If you list all of the individual public keys and each person signs with their public key to prove that they individually control it, then that would be sufficient. Um, but I'll come back to, to why we don't want that for Bitcoin. But, uh, but the general question is, is a good one. So the normal way to get a multi-signature is actually to list all of the individual public keys. So I've been doing a bit of a sleight of hand here. I've been saying, oh, we can add all of these public keys together to get this joint public key and everyone knows that this joint public key that is controlled by, by these individual people because they add up. I mean, that's not really true, right? What hits the blockchain is a sum public key. And from the blockchain's perspective, somebody owns this public key P, and that somebody signed with it. And from Bitcoin's perspective, that's all anyone cares about, that's all ordinary validators care about, is whoever owned the coins, like P, the public key, identifies whoever owns the coins. And the fact that behind the scenes, it was actually multiple people, is not important to the Bitcoin network. So there are kind of two, two verifications that have to happen, um, or two, two forms of verification. One is the blockchain verification, which is just, did a person controlling this key sign for it? The other is like actually to verify this as a multi-signature, you need to know the individual public keys. That's right, so, so people who care about the actual parties behind the scenes, such as the party themselves, need to preserve this list somewhere. Uh, but just to make sure, Still not a secure multi-signature scheme, it's still vulnerable to the attack on the next slide. Yep, yep. So 
That's uh, so I saw a bunch of pictures. I asked anyone who took a picture of the last slide, please take a picture of this one too. Um, <laughs> Um, because um, this actually does not work as a multi-signature, and even if I list all the individual keys, this does not work as a multi-signature. And the reason is that suppose that the last party, um, let's imagine that everybody provides a public key, like in order of the first person, second person, whatever. The last person can just choose what they want the final key to be, and subtract off everyone else's key, and say, oh yeah, that's uh, this different, that's my key. And then as soon as you add this difference to everyone else's key, by, by definition, you're left with this key that the last party chose. And so the last, so then the final joint sum public key, even though everyone can verify that every party contributed here, is actually the last person individually controls the, the entire public key. They chose something for which they know the secret key for by themselves. Yes, oh yes, this is called a rogue key attack. Yes, um, so when you hear the term rogue key attack, this is, this is roughly, what it means. Um, it turns out that even if you harden this in some, some intuitively um, hardening ways, uh, there are still road key, road key attacks that, that can occur. But this is the most basic one. This is the most naive way to do multi-signatures um, until, uh, um, I guess there's a whole bunch of, of folklore leading up to how to, to harden against this, how to do like key randomization kind of stuff, or how do you structure the signatures differently. Um, and then in 2006, um, they hear Belair and Gregory Nevin, who is, who is in this room, um, he wrote a paper uh, called The Forking Lemma, uh, something like 20 words about the Forking Lemma, and PS, a multi-signature scheme. Um, and the multi-signature scheme uh, was actually something that prevented rogue key attacks. Um, and so that, that is kind of like the, the standard basis for any multi-signature schemes. Uh, at least in the case that your verifiers always know all the public keys. Okay. Um, so suppose, um, actually before, okay, there's two, two things I want to say. Suppose that we want to have a verification equation that only depends on the sum of the public keys. Um, so if you want the blockchain validators to just have the sum of public keys, they can verify the signature. It turns out in that case you cannot use Blair Nevin because the only verification equation for Blair Nevin is, uh, is one that requires knowledge of the individual public keys. We don't want to publish that on the blockchain. It's a privacy leak and, and it's bigger than a single key. Um, so instead, um, we're going to focus on, on multi-signature schemes that let us compress the keys all together so that we have this kind of uh, weak verification but that uh, only involves a sum. So one way to do this is to say, well, if we're worried about somebody adding, um, just adding everyone else's key together and providing a public key that secretly has everyone else's keys mixed in, why don't we just force everyone to prove knowledge of their individual secret key? And they can do that, say, with a Schnorr signature where they hash in their public key. Um, uh, this is a standard thing that you can do. There's, there's a, a cryptographic security model called COSC, Knowledge of Secret Key, where you assume everybody does this. This is not a very good fit for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is very weird um, in that you often send coins to public keys without those public keys being online and being like participating in that. And so here's what I mean. I say the sender chooses a public key. And this means, for example, I could send coins to a two of three output controlled by two of, of you know, three people in this room without any of you guys actually participating in that. I can just like fetch your keys from random servers and, and paste them together. I shouldn't do that, of course, like who knows if you even control a key. But something that I might reasonably do, I send coins to like a, a multi-signature between me and an HSM that I keep in a safety deposit box. Um, um, at my parents' house or something like that. If it's not, don't, don't go to my parents' house. <laughs> um, and this is something that I would reasonably do um, if, um, if multi-signatures are more ergonomic in Bitcoin and if there's tooling for it. Um, but the trick is that this HSM is in a safe somewhere. It's in a bank safety deposit box somewhere. It's in a freezer, I don't know. Um, it is not online when I receive coins. If someone asks me for a Bitcoin address, I want to be able to produce that address and let them send me coins without having to go you know, unfreeze the, the hardware token. Um, so knowledge of secret key is, is not very nice because it requires proof of, of control of the secret key. Uh, in general, it requires a, a signing time, I think. Um, I'm, not, I'm not certain about that, but the, the point is we 
Cheese are often offline when they're used in Bitcoin. The second reason, which is actually more serious, um, well, it would be more serious in a taproot world, is that there's a, a rogue key attack on taproot, which actually works even with the knowledge of secret key assumption. Um, so you can do exactly the same thing, where somebody is now providing not a key that cancels out everybody else's key, but a key that adds this extra hash of, of PEC thing, an extra commitment, or some extra thing. And sort of all those nice things that I said about, um, about these public key commitments, that no one can tell that they're there and so forth, suddenly that's very bad because the last party here has managed to put a taproot condition on the final public key in a way that the other participants can't tell that they did. Okay. So they could put a second lock on it, essentially. Yeah, they, they could put a second lock on it. Uh, and Taproot, they could just steal the coins. They, they add a commitment to a script that has just their own public key. Um, so, uh, so that's very bad. And so we want a way, um, so the knowledge of secret key can't prevent that. Because um, the attacker here knows their own secret key. Um, which means that they know the secret key to the, the taprootified uh, version of their secret key. Um, so they still know the secret key, they can still do knowledge of, of secret key here, um, but they can attack the system. And, uh, and the reason that you can do that is not that these knowledge of secret key schemes are insecure, it's that the security model for taproot is different from the security model of signatures. Okay, like this stuff is all very, very subtle to try to reason about. Um, Taproot has this weird alternate condition, which does not appear in a normal cryptographic signature game. Okay, so instead we use this key combining technique called music. Okay, we're going to stick with the paradigm where we're going to add, um, we're going to add um, together um, all of these public keys to get a single public key that uh, that somehow represents um, control by all of the individual people. The way we're going to do this is a little bit involved. We're going to take um, a C, we're going to take a hash of all of the individual public keys. We're going to then, for every participant, we're going to hash up that hash along with their index. So we're going to number everybody, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then we'll get a, a what's called the music coefficient. And then before we add any one public key to the sum, we're going to multiply by the music coefficients. And now the result is if anybody tries any funny business, if anybody changes their key, they're going to change this C, which means they will change every single music coefficient, which means that now the, the public key that they're trying to mess with has completely changed out from under them in an unpredictable way. So there's not really any way to get any, uh, any traction. And that's the, uh, that's the intuition for, for why this works. Um, although there, again, there, there are some, some subtleties to actually arguing that this is secure in a rigorous way. Um, I should also also plug Gregory again. Um, in his talk yesterday, he, he was describing a paper that he wrote with Dan Bone and, uh, and Manny, um, Manny, 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 Manny Drivers, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, in which uh, they, they took this technique, they also applied it to BLS signatures, uh, which is cool and not, not obvious that you could do. Um, and then also they did the, the uh, um, uh, accountable subgroup kind of stuff. Um, so actually, let me, let me talk briefly. I'm, I'm getting on a tangent, and I know there's a lot of material, but I'm just going to go on a quick tangent about accountable subgroups. No, I'm not. Okay. I, I, I will come back to that maybe if I... Um, if I have n participants here, and they all jointly produce a signature, um, assuming that I have a workable multi-signature scheme, it's clear that all n participants like the, the security property that we wanted, that all end participants participated. If I were to extend this to having, like, say, k of n, like two of three people instead of three of three, um, which I'm not going to go into because I, I don't have time, um, there would be a question of, well, now there are a whole bunch of different sets of people who might sign. Um, Right, if we, if we had Gregory and Dan and, and Manny all doing a two of three, how do we know that it was um, whether, given a signature, whether Gregory or Dan, or whether Dan and Manny, like who, who signed this? Um, and there's a property of multi-signatures, uh, of threshold signatures, sorry, called accountability. If it has subgroup accountability, then you can tell from the signature who was responsible. Um, if it does not have accountability, you cannot. And if you extend music, 
to the k of n case in a way that is, is um, kind of obvious to, to people who spend all day thinking about signatures, uh, you will get a Okay, um, you are going to, oh, that feels, that feels better. <laughs> you will get a non-accountable multi-signature scheme. Okay, um, yeah, that, that, that's all. And then if you want accountability, that, that's something that's much more involved and, and that's something you can find in, in Gregory's paper. Um, but that, that's a tangent. I'm not going to talk about threshold signature schemes, only uh, N of N signature schemes. So, let's put this all together. Here is an actual protocol for two of uh, two people. Um, it's the two participants to do some multi-signature together. Here, here are the steps that they do. Um, so at key setup time, they do all of this music business. They hash up their, their public keys. Um, they use uh, the hash to then derive these music coefficients. They multiply their public keys by their respective coefficients, and, uh, and then they publish the sum. So what they would put on, on the blockchain, or what somebody who's trying to spend, both Alice and Bob, would put on the blockchain, is this public key P, that's a sum. And then anybody who knew Alice and Bob's individual keys would be able to verify that this was, this was done correctly. Um, and anybody who didn't would simply know that, uh, that there was some key out there, um, and, and the coins couldn't be spent with a signature on that key. So then if Alice and Bob uh, receive coins to an address controlled by this key, and they want to, to spend those coins, they do this multi-signature scheme. So it's a two-stage, two stages of interaction. Um, I mean, they, they agree on, on the message M on the transaction that they want to jointly sign, and then they each choose their individual nonces here. Um, and you can see. So I don't. For those of you who were at Connor's talk, you remember he had like a full slide of like very tiny text with like the uh, like 20 uh, 20 stage multi-signature scheme. Um, this this is it. It's just this. They, they choose these two nonces and they add them together. That's the equivalent for Schnorr. So I really want to emphasize how much simpler this is. They add up their nonce, they hash their joint public key, their joint nonce, and the message to get a challenge. Great. And then each of them individually produces a signature. And they're signing here. You can see where their secret key used to be, where X used to be, is now their secret key times their music coefficient. And if you add those two things together, you will get a, a signature on the message M with a public key P. Oh, that, that's a good question. So what we need in music is we need every participant to have a different hash. And so what the index provides is a um, unique individual, uh, a unique uniformly random randomizer uh, for each participant. So one way that you could just, if your public keys were unique, you could set, instead hash in the individual public key, um, say, and that would work. Um, I chose to do the index because that will work even if your public keys aren't unique. Um, and it's, it's a little bit easier to reason about. Uh, but you need to somehow like provide a salt that's unique per participant, is the idea here. Because I need a different randomizer for every participant. Andrew, is there some reason you need the, the double hashing? Why? Uh, why this this double hashing? Yeah, yeah well, why, why are you hacking PC? Oh, um, because uh, my P, P1 through PM. Can you so, just put those into? Yep. So, okay, so the question is why do I have two hash functions here? Or why am I in, I'm invoking this hash function twice? Um, in fact, if I was writing on paper, I guess I'd have to give them a different name or something. Um, the answer is that we could we could just hash all of the public keys in the index here. There is no need for me to be using this hash C. Except the list of all these public keys is going to have size um, 257 bits times n. Um, and C itself will be only 256 bits which means that this I can do with a single SHA-2 compression. OK, not quite, because I have those length both six. I can do this in two SHA-2 compression rounds, uh, which is 500 nanoseconds. If I was hashing all of the public keys individually, I would have to hash a, a bunch more data, and it would take me much longer. No, no, no. you can save submit state. Yeah, yeah, I, I can save this C. I can compute C once and then reuse it. I'm not sure uh, under which assumptions this is uh, secure. Uh, if because, you have, because you could have uh, length extension attacks and so on. If you, so have, if you have length extension attacks, yeah. you are outside of the security model of this, of this scheme. Um, but the condition under which this is secure is assuming you have a collision-resistant hash function, wherever I would be adding, wherever I'd be hashing data, 
I can hash a, a hash of that data. That's it. That's you very straightforward to compose hashes like this. You just need collision resistance. Yeah, and then if you have length extension attack, you do not have collision resistance. Yeah, that's that's all. Um, okay, so here here's a signature scheme. You can see two steps: produce your nonces, add them, get a challenge. The second step is produce your signatures, add them, publish a signature. Okay. Maybe it's worth mentioning that if you uh, exchange the nonces in a straightforward way, you actually don't get a secure scheme. Oh, yes, okay, all right. All right, so, um, was, was, was it you who broke our, our paper? Yeah, well, yes, no. Then we were honest enough to propose a fix that actually yeah. was broken as well. So. Yes, no. <laughs> Amazingly hard, like, I, so I sort of hand wave, like, we're mixing all the keys, and when you change a key, then, then everything's random again, and therefore it's secure. In real life, um, a lot of pages have been written that were wrong about why, <laughs> why this is secure. So yeah, so if you actually do this in two stages, as I wrote, um, this is still not provably secure. Um, like we have a paper uh, coming out the next few days, there's actually even a tax on it, so it's really cool. insecure. Really? Wow. Oh, okay, I, you told me that, and then I, I couldn't remember if, if it was our paper that was attackable. Wow. Cool. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, so there is actually, you cannot just have the, the parties compute their nonce as an exchange. You need a, a, a step zero here, where each party chooses their nonce, they hash up their nonce, and they exchange hashes of the nonce, and the, the, these hashes are behaving as commitments now. So everybody pre-commits to their nonces in step zero. <laughs> step one is this. They, they provide their actual nonces, um, everyone verifies that it matches the commitments, um, and then they just add the nonces together. Step three is, is say, produce a signature for now. So it's a three-step protocol. Um, yeah. Worth mentioning that the implementation was always a three-step. Yes, oh, and then to be clear, all the code that I've written always has the three steps. Um, and then I, so Jonas asked me to mention that. He kindly did not ask me to mention that I complained about this constantly and said that it couldn't possibly be necessary and that I wouldn't do it for my own signature. Anyway, it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> There's, uh, there's value in provable security here, um, absolutely. But yeah, sorry, I don't have my, my source on this laptop, so I can't fix the slide in front of you, but there should be a step zero where they exchange pre commitments to the nonce. Um, yeah. So, let me come back and then just talk about the pub public uh, point commitments. Uh, I think maybe actually for the last time, this time, it's just so cool, these point commitments do all sorts of cool things. So in this partial signature scheme, um, um, you you do the, these three steps. Um, if you, you combine the first two steps into one where people exchange nonces, uh, you find that the last step involves working on this commitment E, that is a hash of everything, it's a hash of the total nonce. Um, and if somebody does not do, let me go back actually, if somebody does not do this final step, the signature does not get produced, okay? So everybody has an opportunity before completing the signature, before doing their part to finish it, to evaluate what is a public key, what is a message, what is a nonce, all that good stuff. There's kind of a cool property here, which is that if you want to do a signed a contract in a multi-party multi signature, it's very easy to do that. You just take the total nonce and you add this, this publicly known tweak to it. Um, and actually, you can have signers that insist on having, um, on having some specific signed a contract thing. And then the individual signers We'll have a um, we'll have sort of this extra data, this extra commitment that's in the signature, and this commitment is actually signed by the resulting signature. It's kind of this bizarre uh, uh, provable security property um, that the individual signers now have a signature that they can publish to the blockchain, and that signature uh, has some extra extra data that the individual parties made sure that they had before participating. So you might do this with some some auxiliary data, like like some detailed invoice or something. Where you might do this, um, in kind of an interesting way, uh, place you might do this, is if you're doing a, a non-accountable two of three scheme, you might have all the participants who are signing be using HSM to demand that you sign the contract to an accountable signature. So now the individual signers have an accountable multi-signature that they have signed, so by transitivity, it's signed on the blockchain, and now they have this accountable signature that they can write down and they can give to their auditors and all of that good stuff. Um, but it doesn't appear in the blockchain. They're always trying to minimize how much, how much you put in the blockchain. 
Um, so the individual signers have an accountable um, uh, multi-signature that they can use for their own auditing purposes. Uh, they secretly commit to that in a non-accountable multi-signature and they publish that. Um, the security property of this is, is not as good as an actual accountable multi-signature. Um, in particular, if a bunch of signers collude to produce a signature without doing the sign the contract thing, then or, or if they just delete their commitment or whatever, uh, then, then you're, you're stuck. But you can imagine implementing this in hardware and then you have a, hardware, a trusted hardware assumption where you're trusting the hardware to make the signature accountable, which is like a, a very weak trust point that, that's maybe acceptable in some contexts. I mean, you're already trusting the hardware to produce the signatures, right? Which is a very strong thing to trust hardware with. So, so that's just a neat idea. Um, and uh, anyway, that, that's all I have to say about signing a contract. Um, when you use it in multi-signature, it, 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 you get this kind of new, new useful property from it. So let's talk about scriptless scripts. Um, and I have, I think, half an hour left. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'm going to take a whole hundred minutes, guys. Thank you so much for, for sitting quietly. <laughs> um, so, suppose, so, so let me talk, sorry, I, let me talk a little bit more about this final step where each party produces their, uh, their partial signature. I sort of wave my hand and said, oh, this is just like a Schnorr signature. It is just basically like a Schnorr signature. I can do exactly the same transformation on it. If you have a partial signature, I can multiply every term by G. I can replace the, the resulting XGs with Ps and the resulting KGs with Rs. Um, and I get a verification equation. So I can verify partial signatures. I can make sure that they're legitimate. Um, one, uh, this is actually very frustrating to make a, a nice API to do this. Because normally in a Schnorr signature, when you're verifying it, you have this challenge E, which is a hash of your public key in your message. Here, I've got E here is a hash of the total public key and the total nonce and the message Meanwhile, in the actual signature equation, I've got the individual signer's nonce and the individual's public key. If you want to these APIs that take like 20 public keys per function, and then I can't. So, um, but you can verify it. You can verify the partial signatures, uh, which is cool, um, which is good if you're doing more than two of two uh, and your signature doesn't add up. This is useful because you can identify which individual party is providing a public signature. Um, but where this gets really cool, is you can attach extra semantics to these individual partial signatures. Uh, so this is what's called an adapter signature, which is a building block for a lot of this, this scriptless script stuff that I've been talking about. So here's what I mean algebraically. Um, so suppose that, or let's, let's stick with two parties to, to be more concrete. We've got Alice and Bob and Bob. Um, in, uh, in step zero, when Bob is providing a commitment to his, um, to his nonce, uh, he also say provides this extra, yet another ephemeral key pair um, that we're gonna call it TT. Um, when I'm reading this, this is okay, but when I'm saying it out loud, they're both T's. I'm the little T and big T. Um, and we call this an adapter, an adapter, or an adapter key pair. We call the little T a secret adapter, we call the big T a public adapter. Um, and, uh, and so Bob's going to give the public adapter to Alice before anything, is, is, uh, anything starts. And then the two of them are going to do this protocol. Um, and, and now, instead of Bob providing a partial signature, he's going to compute his partial signature and he's going to add his secret adapter to it. And it's easy for Alice to verify that he did this. She just takes the, uh, the partial signature verification equation, she adds the public adapter to it, um, you can see if, if you remember the equation on the last slide was identical to this, except it didn't have didn't have its teeth. Um, so it's a very straightforward modification. And the cool property of this is that this so-called adapter signature is just a, a valid partial signature that will 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 work in the in the multi-signature scheme, except that it's offset by this this kind of secret adapter T. So if anybody learns a valid signature, they can subtract that here. And, and get a, and learn T. If anybody learns T, they can subtract it here and get a valid signature. So it's sort of this ex extraneous information that is somehow knowledge of this extra information is equivalent to knowledge of a valid signature. Uh, yeah, uh, in the back first. Uh, so, uh, you go, is it is the T chosen the same way as R is chosen, or is it different? Uh, that's a good. So, what uh, the question is, how is T chosen? Um, and 
in practice, T does not have the kind of strong security requirements that the secret key or the, um, the secret nonce have. And the reason is that this T here is only, like the, the adapter pair, is only used in one signature. So it's okay if T is biased. What T needs to be here, what the secret adapter T needs to be here is un unguessable. So it needs to be a large random number. But it doesn't actually have to be 256 bits. You could do it with like a 128 bit number, say, um, which is useful in, in some contexts, like if you're, if you're going across curves and, and stuff like that. And the smaller your number, the smaller your, your proofs are. Um, but T, T needs to be random, randomly selected from a large enough set that it's unguessable. That is what you need. Um, and oh, I should be careful. You can use uh, big step, little step. So the, the security. So you, you publish the, the public adapter corresponding to T. If, if little T is 128 bits, you can actually grind that out of a uh, big T and only 64 bits of work using using uh, some certain algorithm. So the T needs to be large enough to be unguessable times two. It's have twice as many bits as you would think you need to be unguessable. Um, but it doesn't, like, it doesn't need to be unbiased. It, it, you can really be a little bit sloppy with using T because it's just a one shot, one shot thing that does not affect the security of any of your actual keys. It's just being added on to signatures here. Uh, yeah. Well, not everybody can compute t little T, right? Only the people who are, who are involved in the signature. Yeah, that is correct. Um, so, so, so far I've just described this as, as something that Bob gives to Alice as part of the signing protocol. This is not going to be, none of this is going to hit the blockchain. Well, we'll hit the blockchain with like a final signature here. And so the individual parties um, will, will know these adapters, will, will know all of the relevant data, but that's not something that they publish. It's only used inside of the multi-signature scheme. Okay? So we have an adapter signature. We have a signature. Um, we, have, we have some object which, uh, which grants the bearer of, of the adapter signature the magical ability to translate knowledge of a partial signature into knowledge of some ephemeral secret, and vice versa. What, uh, what can we do with that? Um, should I go through this? So th this is just restating it like much more specifically. Um, I'm not, I'm not, not going to. Oh, OK, I'll, I'll leave it up for a sec to take some pictures. But this is just a, a repeat of what I said before, just laid out step by step. Um, once again, I forgot to, to exchange pre-commitments to my nonces. Um, but you do, um, so here, oh, I switched Alice and Bob and then what I said and what I wrote. Um, but now Alice provided the adaptive signature. Bob gives her an ordinary signature. And now the cool thing is here is that actually Alice, um, if she wants to give the secret adapter to Bob, she does not have to, to give it to him. She does not even have to give a signature to him. She can just compute her signature, um, add it to Bob's partial signature. She'll, she'll get a valid signature. She just publishes that to the blockchain. Um, and then Bob will read it off the blockchain, subtract his own contribution from it, um, and subtract the adapter signature from it, and then what he will be left with will be negative T, I guess. So he will learn the secret adapter just from the, the um, transaction, just from a valid signature being on the blockchain. So if you create a transaction this way, you can create a transaction where you're actually, where Bob is giving Alice um, giving Alice money in exchange for revealing the secret TA. Okay, and, and here's where, where we're getting into like scripts of scripts. Here's where I'm doing something kind of spooky, where what I'm publishing to the blockchain is just an ordinary signature with an ordinary public key, but behind the scenes are these extra semantics. Behind the scenes, the only way that this signature could have hit the chain is if Alice gave this secret T to Bob. Okay. So what, what can I do with this? Um, there's sort of a, um, an obvious application. This is obvious to, to people who play with signatures all day and also read Bitcoin talk all day, uh, is to apply this to a zero knowledge contingent payment. Uh, this, is, this is a, a mouthful of a term. What this refers to is, um, is taking a Bitcoin payment and selling it in exchange, uh, uh, sorry, selling some secret data. But specifically here, the secret data is a witness to some MP problem or something, or, or more likely it's like an encryption key to, to the solution to some MP problem. Um, so a couple years back at Financial Crypto 2016, I think, 
um, Greg Maxwell sold Sean Bowie, um, or vice versa, the solution to a Sudoku puzzle. The way this worked is, is Sean solved the, um, I think Greg, no, Greg solved the Sudoku puzzle. He, he took the solution, he AES encrypted it, um, he then provided a zero knowledge proof, I think it was a snark, to Sean, um, using, uh, but then it was a snark saying, hey, I've got this, uh, well he didn't use adapter signatures, he used like a hash, but he said, hey, Sean, here's a commitment of some sort to, uh, to the encryption of a Sudoku puzzle, um, and here is, you know, here's a snark, a suiting line. And so then the two of them did some protocol where, um, keep getting this back with the Greg sent, where Sean sent money to Greg in a way that Greg could only take the money by revealing this secret, which was this, this decryption key. Um, and there, there was kind of a fun, uh, this was in Barbados, we had no internet connection, so the blockchain that Sean was using to, uh, to verify this transaction line was actually one that he had copied from my laptop. Uh, so, I mean, but if we had proper connectivity, we could have verified the payment in a more meaningful way. But that's, uh, that's an aside. So, um, so it's called a zero knowledge contingent payment. We can do this with adapter signatures. The way that Sean and Greg did this is they had like a, uh, the encryption key was just hashed. We threw that hash onto the blockchain um, and said, hey, Bitcoin, don't let these coins move unless someone provides a hash pre-image. The result is a script that looked kind of wonky, like it clearly had a hash and a hash pre-image and two signatures and all this extra stuff. Um, it revealed the hash, it revealed the hash pre-image. Everybody had to download these things. Everybody had to verify that they were consistent. Um, it was very wasteful. Um, the way that we could have done this with adapter signatures uh, is that now the public adapter would replace this hash secret key. The secret adapter would have been the secret key. And once again, Sean could have snarked up that all of this was, was being done correctly. And, um, and then what hits the blockchain is just a single public key and a single signature with that public key. No one can tell that there was some sort of exchange going on. No one can see what the challenge was. No one can see what the answer to the challenge was. In fact, after the fact, anyone could kind of make up the challenge and, and subtract it from a signature on the blockchain and say, hey, this, this is a sale. But no one can tell it's a sale. No one can prove it's a sale. No one can even tell that two parties were involved. This is actually a sale of, of in this case, a, a Sudoku solution, um, which happens in a trustless manner in that the money cannot change hands unless the solution changes hands, assuming that the snarks are secure and, and, and so forth. Um, and yet what hits the blockchain is indistinguishable from an ordinary person sending money, person A sending money to person B kind of thing. And all anyone has to verify is that person A sent money to person B. Okay, so it's, it's much, uh, much more efficient, um, it's much more uh, private than the hash-based protocol. And it's really kind of, kind of spooky, isn't it? That you can, you can take an ordinary looking signature and have it encode these kind of semantics. Uh, I guess there's a limitation on the amount of data you can send, right? Like two, two, six bits or? Uh, so, it's, yes, so all you can send uh, in the signature is 256 bits, because that, that's the size of a secret adapter. But um, you can send much more data by using some external zero knowledge proof scheme. If you have like megabytes of data, you can encrypt that uh, with a 256 bit key and provide a zero knowledge proof that you did that encryption and that when you reveal, so you're sort of turning this 256 bit object into a much larger object by using encryption and zero knowledge proofs to amplify it. But in both cases, uh, you are running the risk of getting a solution that is not the actual solution to the to do no, if you do a zero knowledge, so, so the zero knowledge proof that's provided here is that there is a valid solution and that solution is the thing that's encrypted. Yeah, so the zero knowledge proof, um, the, the question is, is whether you could, you could give a fake solution. The answer is the zero knowledge proof here is proving that it's a real solution and that the real solution was encrypted here. But it's doing both, so there's very high assurance here. Uh, do Alex first. Um, in reality, Right, yeah, so, so, I'm, I'm, so Alex asked about, about time lock, so I'm, I'm talking past the sale a little bit here. I'm sort of assuming that there are coins that Alice and Bob have to participate to, to spend. In real life, um, uh, the way that you would do this, is, or the way that, that Greg and Sean did this, is that Sean is going to pay Greg, so he put some coins up in an output that was controlled by both of them, and so the two of them had to cooperate, they had to do this kind of protocol in order to get the coins back. 
Before um, Sean put his money up, he required Greg sign an alternate transaction, giving him all the money back that would only be valid a week later, or something like that. Um, and that's important. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that because it's sort of a, a complicating factor, but it's a critical factor that in these actual protocols, during the setup phases, you need to have uh, a way such that if one or both parties walk away from the protocol and refuse to continue, then, uh, then the money will just go back to the original holder uh, after some time. So there's time-locked refund construction. Um, and this, this becomes important sometimes when you're doing like incentive analysis kind of stuff, like if, if you're trying to exchange coins this way and you're worried the price might change and then somebody might back out and then that, that gets more complicated. But just to, to make sure that the coins can't be stuck, you need to do a bunch of extra setup phases that I don't want to talk about that ensure <laughs> that, that when somebody stops, or when somebody backs out, the coins will eventually come unstuck. That, that also potentially could like, de anonymize you, right? Right, so, take away the in, okay, so in some ways of doing a time-locked refund, it would reveal that something funny had happened. In this case, when there's actually just two parties trading, there is no need for any privacy loss. So that they could use a time-locked transaction, which, uh, which gives the coins back to Sean in the case that the time runs out. And if Sean publishes this to the blockchain, the result is just a time-locked transaction being published to the blockchain. And most every transaction is time-locked. Or not, not every transaction. Every transaction that Core produces, for example, is time-locked with a recent block. Um, there's no reason not to do this. Um, it, it, it improves minor incentives a little bit, but importantly, it improves the privacy for people who are actually using time locked as time locks. So that's not that's not a, a privacy looting thing to well, stick time locks in. Right, yes, and, and I'm also kind of um, I've been assuming but, but not stating that we would have taproot if we're doing this. And so the, the any 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 actual script conditions that you might need to do in more complex protocols, in the cooperative case at least would not be revealed because taproot is hiding them. Um, but here, uh, even in the non-cooperative case, if you have just two parties doing one thing and not chaining them, uh, you can do lock times and then you don't even have to reveal anything, even in the uncooperative case. Can you attach multiple adapters? You cannot attach multiple adapters, no. Um, I mean, you can sort of do it with like encrypting them both and then doing the zero knowledge proof kind of trick. But, uh, but no, I spent a while trying to do like multi-adapter signature things, and I, I never really got anywhere with that. Um, so the, the, um, the question was, can you have multiple adapters? The answer is no, um, but... Wait, why not? Couldn't you just nest a bunch of ZK proofs together? But like, well, you could. Adapter plus ZK and around right. that. Yeah, so the question is, can't you just like keep nesting encryption with your knowledge proofs? And you can, but then like, you just got one big adapter. Sure, but like right. you could do it. It's just maybe it's not ideal for your. Yeah. Teams. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So, so, um, yeah. Let me restate that. If you want to just provide a whole bunch of different adapters at once, provided that you provide a signature, then that uh, that will work. That's great. If you want to have like two adapters and you reveal one or the other. The way that you have to do that is by doing this entire protocol in parallel twice, and then only completing one or the other of them. There's no way to, uh, there is no way to have like a choice of adapters within a single, um, within a single protocol run. And this this protocol only really works with two of two, or does it work with multiple parties? Right. The question is, what if you go beyond two parties? Um, and it only really works with two of two. The reason being that if, well, you can do it with three of three. Or so you can do it with n of n, you can do it with any, any larger set. But what you need is that the two parties that are doing this adaptive signature protocol, they can't do the adaptive signature stuff until everyone else is signed. Until they know that the, uh, the person providing the, the, um, um, providing the adaptive signature um, will reveal the secret adapter if and only if the transaction completes. Like they need that to be atomic. So the concern with multiple parties is, suppose that you and I are doing some, some adaptive signature protocol, say, and we, we broke Jonas in, so we're doing a, a three of three with Jonas. So I, I give you an adaptive signature, um, you're like, great, I'm going to sign, um, and then uh, somehow or other, I, let's say, you obtain the secret adapter, 
um, maybe from some other thing we're doing in parallel. And now you can get my signature for my adapter signature, but Jonas hasn't done anything. So now even though um, I gave you this, uh, this secret, which presumably I did in exchange for some sort of goods, you can't use that because we also need Jonas to assign. So if, we, if we're doing a, a many party case, we sort of need all of the, the bystanders to complete the, the multi-signature protocol before you can really uh, make this work. But it definitely complicates things. So you need to squash all the signatures into one signature and then do it in two or two. Yeah, yeah. The, the question is can you can you like compress a, a larger thing into a two of two? And the answer is yes, using these, these music tricks, and that might be a bit easier to think about. Um, yeah, that's all I want to say there. Um, cool. Um, Oh, and then just as, as an aside, it's not necessarily true that you have to like provide like some some zero knowledge, like a general snark or something that you solve some general problem and that you uh, you uh, encrypted it using AES and blah blah blah. There are some zero knowledge protocols where like you actually are directly revealing the discrete log of something, like say the opening of a PS equipment or like a blind signature. Um, and Jonas has come up with a couple protocols for selling these where you don't need snarks, you don't need general zero knowledge proofs or something. Um, like Jonas has a scheme where, where I can send him coins that he can only take in exchange for completing a blind signature protocol that we're doing in parallel. And the result is that I can exchange coins with him. I can send him a Bitcoin, he sends me a Bitcoin, and he doesn't know which Bitcoin he sent me. This is like Tumblebit, it's it something uh, Ethan Hellman developed. Uh, uh, couple of years ago, except that it has no evidence on the blockchain that more than one party was involved, let alone that there was a blind swap going on or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's kind of double spooky. Okay, um, it's like partially blind or something like that, it's double spooky. Um, okay, so for, for that to make sense, maybe I, I should have started by, by uh, talking about adaptive signatures and atomic swaps. Um, so I, I'm coming in like right on time for just giving a giant lecture. Um, and so, uh, so the uh, the classic, classic the classic application, the uh, traditional application of adaptive signatures, is uh, to use it for atomic swaps. Okay, and you can actually generalize this to um, to doing like many play like, like chaining making one transaction atomic with another transaction with another transaction and doing like lightning payments and stuff like that. And this is what, uh, what Pedro um, talked about yesterday, is generalizing this all to lightning and writing a, uh, a security proof and UC and, and defining a security model and all of that good stuff that I don't like doing, uh, and apparently I'm not very good at. Uh, Pedro did and, and he presented yesterday, um, which is great, but I'm just going to talk about the two-party, just like trading points, okay, but the actually much more general atomic transaction tricks you can do here. Um, so the way, okay, yeah. Um, so the way that you do an atomic swap using adapter signatures is that you do the, um, the adapter signature protocol that I described a few, few slides ago, where somehow Alice is going to sell Bob some, some sort of secret that she knows. And the two of them do this protocol in parallel, maybe on two different blockchains. Okay, so, so Alice puts up some coins in a two of two with, with appropriate lock times and so forth. Bob puts up some coins in a two of two on the other chain with appropriate lock times and, and so forth. Um, and then now, Alice tries, the, the two of them start a protocol which will send Alice's coins to Bob. In parallel, they start a protocol that will send Bob's coins to Alice. And what Alice does on both sides is she provides adapter signatures to Bob with the same adapter, with the same T here, with the same T Alice, I guess I'm calling it. And then the result is that if Alice signs either transaction, if Alice completes either transaction, Bob will learn the secret. Conversely, if Bob learns the secret, then he can complete either transaction. And these two properties uh, work perfectly together. So what will happen is Alice, um, Alice does this, Bob will then sign, or do his part of the signature to, to give Alice her coins on one blockchain. And as soon as Alice completes that, as soon as she takes her coins, she's forced to publish a signature to the blockchain. Bob sees that signature on the blockchain, he subtracts out um, uh, his contribution and her adaptive signature and so forth to learn the secret. He takes the secret, 
combines that with the other adaptive signature to get a signature from her giving him the coins, and then he completes it out. He adds his own contribution to that. And now we have the joint signature giving him the coins. And we can see that as soon as Alice takes her coins, she has given Bob information that he needs to take his, take his coins. Um, and if either of them does not, um, um, if either of them gets their coins, then the other will get their coins. Is there the specific property that we achieve? So if either of them back out, then the entire thing just won't work, and then I guess the lock time will, will come come up, and then the coins will go back to to whoever originally owned them. Um, so once again, we, we have sort of this cool property where there's like really non-trivial semantics going on behind the scenes. You've got these two transactions that cannot execute unless they both execute at once, and yet both of them just have single signatures that are not correlated. They're both uniformly random signatures that are not correlated in any way. Um, that, that are not clearly even coming from more than one person at once. And, um, and yet, there's, there's all of asthmicity happening behind the scenes. Um, and in general, I, I call these things scriptless scripts. The idea is that you've got nothing but a signature. You've got these complex semantics. You've got atomic swaps. You've got sales of secret information. You've got like blind signature swaps, like whatever crazy stuff you might have. And uh, for what hits the blockchain, there's no scripts involved. It's just keys and signatures. Okay, and that that is the end. Thank you very much. For the We've got five or six minutes left, I think. And Nelly's here. Okay, cool. We have five minutes. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, um, I, I can answer them now. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so I know that discrete bond contracts are kind of like a similar thing, to, or like it's a kind of script. This script, right? Yep. Uh, can you talk about like the equivalence or? Not yeah. Equivalence? Um, so the the question is, how do discrete log contracts fit into this? So discrete log contracts are uh, are the brainchild of, of Taj Drya at uh, MIT DCI. Uh, the way these work is that some Oracle, some source of, of some information of the outcome of, of a horse race or whatever, provides a series of signatures, something like similar to an adapter signature in some way, um, but but a little more more flexible, such that depending on the outcome of a horse race or whatever, or on the stock market price or, or whatever you want to think of, exactly one of those signatures will become valid. And other people can take these signatures, or actually they, it's actually public keys, I think. They can take these keys, they can put these into their Bitcoin transactions, and they will create transactions that will only execute assuming the certain outcome of, of some Oracle input. Um, and they do this in such a way that the Oracle can't even tell what, um, like, who is using their input or anything like that. So the algebra is different, this is not an adapter signature scheme. But so morally, it's still kind of a scriptless script, right? It's still a, a deniable, um, non-trivial multi-party protocol in which the only result of correct execution is that a, a single signature hits the blockchain. Um, so if you combine discrete log contracts, discrete log contracts work with ECDSA. If you combine them with Schnorr signatures, then you can compress everything into one, um, and then you get the same kind of deniability. As, as written, the, the kind of discrete log contracts you can do in Bitcoin actually do require multiple signatures, so you can at least tell that multiple parties are involved, but not, uh, not anything more than that, I think. So they're similar, they're not the same as this, but they definitely fit into the, the whole script of script worldview. Yeah, so pay to contracts and uh, pay to signature are, can only be used once, basically. Like, I mean, if you want to do like Taproot, and at the same time you want to uh, do what Liquid does with uh, 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 putting, a, putting a contract there in order to uh, put the coins on the, the sidechain. Um, if you have two use cases, then it becomes less efficient for to go down and like tap room instead of tap room or something along yep. those lines. So do you feel like there's a there's a need to utilize it in a very for a very good purpose and not just haphazardly use it? Or? Um, yeah. So the the question is, what if you try to use um, if you try to commit to multiple things independently? In the same uh, in the same output. Okay, if you've got like a liquid commitment saying here's where, where the money goes, and you've also got a taproot commitment. In order to reveal the outermost one, you have to reveal the inner one as well. You want to have to reveal a lot of extra data, um, or uh, data that's linear in the number of, of things that you reveal. 
you can improve this um, efficiency-wise a little bit with something called Garut, which is a AJ Towns brainchild that I, I can't, uh, I definitely can't go into. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, um, if you have multiple commitments, there's extra data to reveal. Um, but your second question is like, should we therefore like be be have conservative minded about uh, these yeah, commitments? I mean, you're already on like. A Currently, you have Stanford coming up, and RGB wants to similarly use use this trick, so they are kind of like conflicting. So I, I think in practice, you're going to have only two layers of commitments. You're going to have the, the Taproot commitments on Bitcoin, and then outside of that, you'll have whatever commitment these, these third-party protocols care about. Um, and so I guess that there will be, need to be an extra 32 or something bytes of data revealed for the, the extra system. Um, but I can't see it getting any, any deeper than that. My thoughts. Um, at least, so at least at the consensus layer, nobody's talking about going more than one deep. Right. So, uh, I think one more. Yeah. yeah. Looking about this atomic swap example, how does swap puts to Alice that there is using the same uh, TA for his side of the transaction? Like, what it means that Alice generates the his more. So, okay. The, the question is, how do we know Alice is using the same T on both yeah. sides? So if the two blockchains are using the same curve, it's literally the same T. You just like mem them. Um, yeah, I mean, like, what's the math that you have to do to verify to, I mean, take the public key on one side and make sure that there's this T. So if, if they're on the same curve, they're literally equal. Yeah. Oh. They, they will be equal. Um, if, if there are different curves, then, then there's a much more intricate uh, proof that's like involved in kind of translating a point on one curve into a point on the other. Like, the public keys together. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's something more involved there. But, but in general, it's literally just mem right? They're, they're, they're the same, they're the same. You can kind of leave transaction between the Because, yeah. Okay. All right, actually, one more. Yeah, okay. If I understand Yeah, the, the question is what, what can I actually replace with this? The answer is pre-images and multi-signatures and uh, like conjunctions and disjunctions of those. Um, in general, any kind of uh, multi-party contract where you know the set of parties up front and it's a small, like two parties, if you have two parties and you know them both up front and they're both willing to interact, you can do it with scriptless scripts. There's no need for more. Um, and in some cases, you can extend to more parties. Um, but in general, you can't extend it to like open-ended things. So like there are coins right now you can steal, uh, take on Bitcoin if you provide a SHA-2 collision, for example. You cannot do that in scriptless scripts because it's completely open-ended. Anyone can take it. So the set of parties is unbounded and did not interact during setup. So, um, so, so multi-party protocols that have a small fixed set of uh, participants up front can be done in scriptless scripts. And that's the largest set of, of contracts that I, I know we can cover. But it, but it also improves the space efficiency in, in blocks that you don't have to include script you know op, your script sig stuff. Right. Yes. Yeah, so so the, the, the space savings there. Yeah. The, the common if, if you get the space savings, then everybody gets the space savings. Uh, if, if all these common cases are using scriptless scripts, so that's that. All right. And and uh, that is it. I'm out of time. Um, Nelly, thank you. Thank you.